Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Seaweed Brain, a Percy Jackson podcast. Today, we are back. We are still talking about the television show. And this week's episode is going to be about episode six. We're going to Vegas, driving a car for the first time. We're having many important coming of age experiences. Stick around. Welcome back, listeners. It's Lotus Hotel and Casino week. I am wearing my Hot Topic t-shirt that says Lotus Hotel and Casino, not sponsored by Hot Topic, but would frankly love to be. Give us a call. Uh, We are joined today by two (laughs) guests. Everybody say hi to Han, who we are friends with from Percy Jackson Twitter. Hi, Han. Hi. And then we are also today joined by Mike Schubert from the newest Olympian. Hello, Mr. Schubert. Hello. It is great to be here. Before we get started, we need to thank our patrons. Carter, will you go ahead and do that for us? Yes. Dandy, Laura, Jackie, Nathan, Violet, Rika, and Adele. Also, shout out to our sustaining patrons, Dayton, Jordan, and Justin. All right. Let's get into some overarching thoughts on this episode before we painfully go scene by scene through the entire thing. It is no secret that this was a much anticipated episode of the TV show because the Lotus Hotel and Casino was, some might say, just like gifable, you know, a gifable scene from the original movies. And there was a lot of question about how we would handle the scene in the TV show online. There was some buzz about that. And what we have opted for here in Percy Jackson and the Olympians on Disney Plus is exactly what I would assume we would opt for based on the way that the show has been functioning in prioritizing time and again, character, relationship building, and story over Flash, Bam, Alakazam, and big (laughs) set pieces and all of that. We are always coming back to how cleanly and quickly and effectively we can convey the relationships that need to develop in order to push the plot forward. And that is what we see in this episode. I want to hear some initial thoughts, though, from you guys before we go into the action. Yeah, I think my favorite thing about it was that they brought in the stuff that is introduced in like the beginning of book five into that conversation with Hermes. Because I think the initial Mm -hmm. questioning when at least you and I, Erica, were at Comic-Con and they had the pictures of some of the cast people and then you could see Lynn and you're like, he's at a craps table. What's going on? Why is Hermes at the Lotus Casino? What is this? And I love what they've done in this episode because as I was going through the books for the first time and I got to the beginning of book five, I was like, oh, okay. They're trying to make us more sympathetic towards Luke. I get it. Feels a little late, but I understand. And I think Mm -hmm. this is like that classic thing where Rick had the quote saying that this TV show allows him to kind of do it if he could do it all over again. And I think it Mm -hmm. is a smart decision for him and the whole production team to say, let's get the big overarching plot stuff that gets really introduced in the beginning of book five. Let's put it all the way in the beginning so that the Luke understanding is happening from an earlier point. So I loved that. I loved them bringing in Hermes early and letting that all happen. But it still worked in with the original book thing for the Lotus, which was, oh, no, we've lost a lot of time. So I think it was really well done. I think that was my favorite part. Aside from the cab thing, that's a whole separate area. But as far as like big picture what this episode did, I loved that. Yes, we are Luke understanders, not (laughs) Luke apologizers, because he hasn't done anything wrong yet. Um, Hannah, what about you? (laughs) I also love what they're doing with Hermes, bringing him in early. Like it makes so much sense to introduce all that conflict now because they can make callbacks later on maybe give us the flashback of the the argument at may castellan's house that'd be awesome you get to see baby annabeth and like giving that sneak peek with percy and you know what i'm talking about the subaru outback based forearm <laughs> touch yes yes exactly <laughs> exactly what i was talking about but um yeah i love what they did with this episode i think it was so smart and like every scene is important and it's propelling the story and like they're really setting up that season two with Grover and his yes. search for Pan and I'm loving yes. that. So yes. yeah, big fan. Yeah. Carter? Okay. I have my my sister who is younger than me serving as a TikTok norm core correspondent to figure out <laughs> what the people who have no Venn diagram overlap with our listeners have been saying on the streets. <laughs> That's smart to and have. Let me just yeah. say, for those of you, like for the two or three of you who made viral, um, what do you call them on TikToks where you just swipe through them and it's just pictures? Is there a name for this format of content? No. The point is that some people have been complaining and and, and the, the essence of the complaints is that there's too much exposition 
in the show in general and not enough set piece orientation. We're not moving fast enough, but also we're moving too fast on the things that I don't care about. All of this is there to say that the people who are writing this, you should be ashamed of yourselves. You are being silly. You're being incorrect. You're being media um, illiterate. <laughs> you are being media illiterate, and I am genuinely sorry for people who have too much attention span difficulty to enjoy the show as a masterpiece that it is. Like, genuinely, I think that's terrible. Yeah. But also, I, I think that that's not the fault of the show. I think that that's a separate thing that, that needs to be addressed. I think people are just failing to recognize, because I haven't seen a lot of negative criticism, because same thing, like most of my listeners yeah. and stuff are, Our feeds are curated. smart people. Yeah, it's all like people that know what's <laughs> up. But I feel like you have people not recognizing a that the tv show is a tv show and b that the tv mm -hmm. show is in season one of what should be five so this is episode six of what should be at least 40 so yeah i think you're gonna get some exposition in season one of the show and i think you're gonna have some things that are gonna have to be different from a book because a book is a book and a tv show is a tv show and pacing is different like sure we would have loved two episodes at camp but you just can't do that they got to get on the quest so I agree with you, Carter. I think it is yeah. just people failing to like recognize what they are watching. And it's also a lot of people getting like preemptively mad. Like, how about you let the season finish to see where they're going? Because some yeah. things are happening in different order than they yes. do from the book. But I know some people are really mad, like four pearls. What are they going to do with four pearls? It's like, let's watch episode seven to see what they do with four pearls. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait. yeah. This could, I think, come off very easily as being a critique of like, oh, you guys just don't like action. And, and like, you think action is not worth your time. And let me be clear that the four John Wick movies are my four favorite movies they're of all time. Perfect <laughs> films. They're perfect films. I am an action nerd. We are about to record a set of episodes with people from the stunt team, specifically yes, good, because good, good, good. we love stunts, <laughs> we love action, awesome. and we love set pieces. But let us reiterate that content dictates form. Yes. And is this TV show John Wick? No, it is not. The story of Percy Jackson is, in particular, as Carter and I have harped on for years, a story about a boy who isn't cool because of his golden sword, but is cool because he chooses not to use his golden sword and when he chooses not to use his golden sword. So we inherently mm -hmm. want less action in this series than in another yes. generic YA fantasy show. And also there will be action in future seasons. Like there's more action-y books. Yes. To How many times has place? Walker talked about the Ares fight that is coming? Like, <laughs> yes, we're going to get there. <laughs> and they're, they're building it up. They're building That's it up. Like, this yeah. episode is where those critiques are coming to a head is because this is the episode where you'll see the biggest gap between people who don't have the um, the patience and the <laughs> bigger picture. You're, being, you're using um, such nice language right now, Carter. I'm really <laughs> proud of you. I'm trying so hard to not be like a boomer, like, <laughs> Like disparaging the children <laughs> for generational divide reasons, but I, because it's not a generational divide, it's like a do you are you somebody who like is willing to step back and look at a story being told across eight episodes and say, I need to see relational development. We need to see things that are not exposition. That's the other thing. People are being sloppy about what is exposition and what is character development, what is relationship development. Mm -hmm. Any two characters talking for more than thirty seconds is exposition, which is wild because by definition, it's dialogue. <laughs> 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 if you are like developing new facets of a relationship through a conversation, rather than just saying like, these are facts about the world, that's not exposition. When Hermes and Annabeth are having this confrontation, this is telling you things about Annabeth and Hermes through the characterization as well as through the actual words itself of the dialogue. Like people, it's that, it's the idea that like, this is supposed to be a huge set piece when we're at episode six and the point of this episode in the arc of the season is to gear up for other set pieces and to prepare us. Exactly. And to like, not necessarily like plot wise it doesn't make sense for this to be all flash and bang because that's not what the kids are experiencing or learning about or like using as a point of growth yes. in the personal journeys that they're experiencing over the arc of the season and i just yeah. feel like we all need to recognize all of these things <laughs> mm -hmm. and be grown-ups a bit about what it means to tell a real story about relationships between people yes. that change over time rather than just saying like i thought that there should have been a big frat party here because what would a frat party in this episode accomplish does it make sense when they're 12 year olds no does that make, have you seen las vegas is that what it's like no, no it's not the answer is no for all of these things <laughs> you know <laughs> structurally we know that this is episode six out of eight 
And we know that episode mm-hmm. eight is going to be a big finale, which probably indicates to us that episode seven is going to be penultimate drama, maybe also action, something very high stakes. It's the, ele- like, episode seven is essentially the 11 o'clock number. And I'm going to explain uh-huh. that musical theater reference out for our two listeners who aren't musical theater people, <laughs> who are also the people on TikTok, apparently. <laughs> the two people. <laughs> That's when you want to pick up the energy, make sure the audience is awake before we wrap up all the loose ends at the end of the show. And so knowing that we're going into the 11 o'clock number, episode seven, episode six should be a moment where it's like the last moment of slowing down. Yeah, Mm -hmm. we right now are at how far I'll go reprise. We are not at confrontation against a Phoebe. You know, like that's- thank you. (laughs) Um, We are Ariel (laughs) crying on the rock. This is the part of your world reprieve. Yeah, we are, we are in dropping the jade piece into the ocean. We are not at. Um, we are in reprise number yet. two of part of your world. Reprise number two. I think also a thing that makes sense for it in the grand structure of this season is when you read the books, you have chapters that are more action packed. You have chapters that are more emotional and a bit slower. It's not like every single chapter or every single section of one of the Percy Jackson books has a fight. Like there's there's highs and lows. There's funnier Mm -hmm. chapters. There's more action packed chapters. There's more serious chapters. So for there to be an episode that doesn't necessarily have a big fight in it, is fine. There's still a lot going on. And I truly thought this episode was really fun. I really enjoyed it. Yes. I would say the other, my other like pull quotey take on this episode is that <laughs> it makes so much sense for what is the true coming of age experience of going in and out of a casino. The true coming of age experience of coming in and out of a c- casino is not doing drugs and eating lotus flowers and partying to Lady Gaga. It is, how do you drive out of a parking garage? That is coming of age, reality, (laughs) emotional truth, comedy, relatability. That's how you do it. That's It's truly the first scariest thing for many people's driving experience. The number of pillars in that parking garage. There were so many pillars. For those of you who are from Hawaii, our five Hawaii listeners, we love you. This episode is literally giving, oh, I went to Dave and Buster's today. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Because Dave and Buster's in Hawaii has one of the worst parking lots known to man. And the Lotus <laughs> Hotel and Casino really is Dave and Buster's. Yeah. It's Dave oh, and Buster's. For sure. In the books, a thousand It's like, what could you percent. do in Vegas as a 12-year-old? It's Dave and Buster's. Yeah. Oh, 100%. There totally. was that one game at Dave and Buster's I was addicted to as a little kid. That was my Lotus Hotel and Casino. It was like the Haunted Mansion game. Um, oh. It was like a spinning the Wheel of Fortune type oh. thing. I made bank tickets on that game. <laughs> and let's remind ourselves, it's maybe fun to play a Dave & Buster's game. Listener, is it visually arresting? Is it fun? Is it nonstop thrill ride to watch people play Dave & Buster's games? No. No, it is not. I don't not. know. You've never seen me at that lights on the wall game. You haven't <laughs> seen me work. I'm like a spider monkey. <laughs> As someone who has spent innumerable hours of my life from childhood to young adulthood watching my dad play craps and him forcibly trying to teach me that it is exciting and valuable for my time, I can I can attest that it is not exciting nor valuable for our time to watch I will other say that people gamble. Valid. Like watching someone play a game more fun, watching casino based things is not fun. Like it's not an enjoyable ride. So I think yeah. the show nailed it. I'm I had a great time and I'm ready to talk about how good of a time it was. Let's uh, All right. jump into Act, Act one, one teaser Chronos dream sequence. Y'all is Kronos Asian? <laughs> no. I genuinely, when we yeah, opened the yes. episode, he was like in shadow. You couldn't really tell what was going on. And I was like, this is an Asian person. I think I recognize this person. I don't know from where, but like, it's clearly Kronos. It's, the, it's headmaster. Just the, actor is the master. The master? Oh, it's, yeah, it's the headmaster from earlier in the show. That's right. It is the headmaster <laughs> from the first episode. And as we start to actually see this person's face and not just hear a disembodied voice with like one beam of light going across the upper corner of the head you can make that connection yeah. it is the headmaster it, we're not actually probably saying the person is going to be playing chronos long term um the, the voice as he is credited the voice as he is credited yes this moment is one of my favorite moments from the book that i forgot about that we are like in percy's perspective basically watching chronos or like unnamed powerful god who is involved with a the theft somehow yelling at somebody else Mm-hmm. for the first time and percy's like the way that we handle the shooting of this in this episode oh, is so smart so fun mm-hmm. we're like you can't see the person's face and then you can see his face but then you can't tell what's happening you can't tell where percy is until you get sh- like you your the shots are like gradually backing up backing up backing up and then you can tell that percy is like behind the door like looking in the corner of the headmaster's office but can't see who's sitting in the chair opposite him 
Why do you guys think that they use the headmaster for this? I think because what we're doing, and this is something that I'm intrigued about, is I wonder if the visuals of this dream looked the same to the lightning thief who's on the other end of this conversation yes. as opposed to Percy. Because I think to Percy right now, the headmaster is one of the scariest people in his life because very recently he got kicked out of school yeah. for doing something he didn't actually do or he didn't know that he did by the headmaster. So I think yeah. it's kind of like, let mm -hmm. me embody something that does terrify Percy. I know yes. he's watching in on this dream. And I think that's why it was. And my big theory is I don't think that that is how it looks to the yeah. lightning thief. Makes sense. Not only is, is the headmaster someone who's intimidating, this is like an exact mirror of the scene that we saw in the earlier episode. This is like, Cronus mm -hmm. yeah. wa just wants to send a message. He's maybe not specifically deciding what it looks like, but for Percy, that message is manifesting itself in this exact thing that he experienced where this person in a position of power is yelling at him and telling them him that he is not worthy. Mm -hmm. So it's his yes. subconscious that puts him in this place, but yeah. obviously the message is intentional. The dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yes, it reminded me of a thing that I had forgot in the books is that like this is the brief arc of Kronos not hating Percy, but basically having Percy as the contingency plan. Mm -hmm. And I was refreshed yes. watching this like, oh, right. That was a very short era in the come on, join my team before grumble, grumble. I hate you with all of my soul kind of vibe. Not even just contingency plan. What this is giving is Percy would be more ideal mm -hmm. than the lightning thief right. in the eyes of Kronos, which makes sense. Kronos is, you know, prestige queen. Yeah, he wants a big flashy name. Stunt One of the casting. big three. Stunt casting. Kronos is such a stunt queen. And and that that's what we're getting here. Kronos says, give me a reason to question your worthiness again. And there is another that just might be ready to take your place. Mm -hmm. And then sort of like turning and like looking at Percy. Isn't that right? We're, yeah, it's giving. Is Kronos threatening yeah. Percy? Is he recruiting him? Is he just observing him from a distance with interest, yeah. light respect? Is it a combination of all of these things? Mm -hmm. Well, I just ask because the headmaster's office is the last time Percy felt like really like attacked by an authority figure. That was the last time he felt super betrayed by a friend. And like, <gasps> I don't know if that'll tie in or something oh, because they, they, that's really, a good point too. they were really leaning on like maybe Grover being the friend that betrayed him, but also not. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know. This makes you think. That's a great point that that was the last place point. he was when he was betrayed by a friend. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> From here, we go into the <laughs> opening scene. We're in the Kindness International truck. Of course, we have to shout out the fact that this in the book of The Lightning Thief is where we get our first like true deep an honest Persebeth moment where we have the conversation between Percy and Annabeth where she starts to open up about her dad and they talk about how maybe they won't be like their parents. Um, but of course, the TV show said, oh, you guys want Persebeth? What if we give you Persebeth? And so we are way past that at this point. They had this conversation <laughs> pseudo on the train to St. Louis. I do a little bit miss the iconic line where Percy asks Annabeth whose side she's mm -hmm. going to be on when the gods are doing their fighting mm -hmm. and she says we're gonna fight together i'll be by your side we don't do that it doesn't make sense for us to do that because that's not a question that feels relevant or like actually on the table at this point in their relationship right. as we've established it i can see that coming up in sea of monsters we could see it coming up in sea of monsters it's true but that like teases us into what we're actually doing here which is sending our iris message to luke yeah that's what ends up happening we're trying to specifically get in touch with chiron mm -hmm. correct which is true in this situation and also in the book right that um the iris message is meant to warn camp in this case different from the book we're like warning camp because grover thinks that and all of the team at this point thinks that we've identified who the lightning thief is and we need to warn camp and get them to prepare appropriately for was going on, it seems like the implication is that like maybe they should be like arresting her or something. We don't like really get that far into the logistics of what might be entailed said, by this. To arrest her. Throw her in the brig. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, we're we're sending out the Iris message. There's like a lot of cute finagling where like Grover is like sticking his head out the top of the thing and like trying to get them light. Annabeth has her special prism that she's using to try to get the reception uh, lined up. We get her second titular 
Seaweed Brain. Weirdest second, shout out by name in the TV show. Carter just did eight <laughs> hair tosses. <laughs> at the end of this episode, the Nereid looks at Percy and goes, you must return to camp. And we have to shout out our friends from the Return to Camp Haplin podcast yes. who got their own name shout out in this episode. It's pretty good. Oh my God, I died. I was like, return to camp. I don't think they'll ever <laughs> say the name of my show, but if they do, I will lose my mind. <laughs> it's actually when Percy chooses immortality and they change the entire plot it would be possible <laughs> if in season five they're like percy you could have the powers you could become the newest, the newest <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that can only happen if in season three we're at the hoover dam and someone is like i wish i had a damn meme page right now to talk about yeah, this God. <laughs> 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 anyway anyway we're having the conversation with luke i want to say that the animation of throwing the drachma into the reflection of the iris message was incredibly satisfying to me and i would like to watch a, a looped gif of that all day everything about this visual is sick yeah. the way that the iris message it's not like a natural rainbow because we're using the prism it looks like oil on water oh, almost you know the way that it's sort like, of have i talked to you guys about what an it iphone actually through is? a water bottle it is an iphone flashlight through a listerine bottle yeah i had asked in the little round table just like, you, you know, obviously you guys do all the big CGI effects, but what is something smaller that people wouldn't notice? And then uh, Jeff White got super excited and he was like, oh, there's a thing where we use a prism at one point. And to do it, we one of the people on the team had the idea to do an iPhone flashlight and a Listerine bottle. So, yeah, so they did that, which is pretty yeah. cool. <laughs> and then I also like that whenever they do the Iris message, the visual that shows up is like when you accidentally hold that phone button down on your iphone for too long and siri pops up <laughs> kind <laughs> of yeah. sort of thing, which is pretty good yeah i love that annabeth just has a prism in her backpack because they Smart. don't have smartphones but obviously if they don't have a phone they would think to carry like annabeth would think to carry a prism around mm -hmm. that that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. charlie mm -hmm. eats down in this scene let's be clear the yeah. vague confusion he has like he's really selling it but you can tell like i really feel like i could tell watching that performance that Luke is a little flustered. Oh, it's perfectly yes. done. It is perfectly done as someone yeah. because they say, we know who the lightning thief is and he waits a beat and then just goes, how do you know? <laughs> Which is a perfect like, yeah, I'm not going to give it it's up. It's a perfect answer. <laughs> it's played perfectly where he comes on a little more like, not blustery, but higher energy, mm -hmm. more intense, pulls back a little bit, a little mm -mm, poker face, yeah. da, 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 and then he a little bit at the end brings it back when we're when we're finishing up our conversation. Yes. You can also almost feel the relief in Charlie's performance once they bring forth the suspicion of Clarice. He kind of mm -hmm. changes like, yeah, you know what? He jumps at it instantly. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah good call. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. let me get the heat off he of He jumps me. at it, but it's also like, it's still light. It's still like within right. very much the emotional range that we've established for this character yeah. which is that he's not going to be effusive it, like we're still going to have the vocal fry we're still going to have the like <laughs> back foot. Carter's been right. doing a really great job of pointing this out which is something I wouldn't have intuitively thought about that like this cool guy demeanor is very much an act that Luke is doing at Ooh. this point like that Ooh. is his cover up he is not actually cool chill guy he isn't Luke is not uh -huh. chill as a person he is putting <laughs> on a front and as we see that little front break a little bit and he gets a little bit more energetic and a little bit more frantic that's when we start to see the real him coming through. Uh -huh. Iconic Persebeth moment. When did you two turn into an old married couple? I think Zoe also warned us about this line in this episode. <laughs> it's so precious. It makes sense for where they are at this point in their relationship. It makes sense for Luke giving you both like protective older brother, but also like amused camp counselor. And also, but like, also let's change the subject right now onto you guys. Let's change the subject right now. But also like, how is this relationship going to complicate my recruitment plans? Like all of these things are layered. I would like to go back to when he answers the call, when he's like Annabeth, like he's immediately like concerned about Annabeth, but then he realizes Percy's there. So he's more like surprised. I don't know. He's like, Mm -hmm, his delivery mm -hmm. of that is so That's interesting real. because he totally thinks yeah. that Percy just like fell into Tartarus yeah. to talk to yeah. Cronus. Yeah, yeah. When he's he like, that call. he's like all worried when he says Annabeth's names, but then he's like, Percy and he's like kind of more surprised to see Percy oh that's such a good or point. did he maybe think that Percy was not going to make it out of the Ares Hephaestus trap situation maybe that was another oh, reason he was maybe to both of them I don't know like how much conversation how much he's Luke in and Ares would have yeah. had right so mm -hmm. maybe he's just shocked to see both of them yeah oh those are such I love that you guys I love that okay Annabeth hangs up the phone this is the first moment in which we realize oh this episode is about to be very much about the relationship between Luke and Hermes setting up the last Olympian mm -hmm. so brilliantly and just in general Luke as as the incredible 
anti-hero that we want him to be. Mm -hmm. A little bit of Grover animal humor. I'm always going to love a joke about opposable thumbs. It's yeah. never not going to be funny to me. <laughs> I love it's always going to hit. Not to mention the like popping his head up out of the truck and seeing the Vegas strip in the background. Once again, we have the screensaverification of Grover. Yeah, we love it. <laughs> that shot is beautiful because that like every time we're moving, you need to find like a not silly way to do your establishing yeah. shot for every new city. And that's a great way to do it. It's so cute. And I have to say, mm -hmm. when you see the strip in the daylight, it is not glamorous. And I love that we popped up to see the strip in the daylight. It's the desert. There's a Cracker Barrel sign. Sign, that says setting cooking up, a, up classics. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> cooking up classics. This is not a cool frat party that we're going to. The strip is weird and sad. Yes. We have that other establishing shot, of course, of the animals that Grover has helped with his opposable thumbs to <laughs> release. In their masterful that, plan. It's beautiful. <laughs> yes. Run out that, of the truck. I think we have to take a moment for this because Gro like, Grover's humor is something that you could imagine with slightly worse writing and slightly worse delivery being like very difficult to sit through. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think there's something that they found within like genuine earnest it is genuine earnestness that really works that it works on our that, like he's not stupid that he's not like trying to derail things like he's someone who's like so committed and nice and like not stupid like like smart and warm-hearted but like has two or three like fundamentally different yeah. ways of viewing the world that will human. always lead yeah he is, he <laughs> yes. is pure but aware and i think the key example of this is when he starts doing all the consensus stuff that is him being pure and then as he explains it further and further to them he realizes oh okay this is a little bit ridiculous now that i've mentioned that verse two encourages us to say nice things about our feelings so he yeah. <laughs> is such a kind soul but then also like knows enough about the world it might take him a little bit but yeah. he will recognize, uh, wait a second. Okay, yeah. I see what everyone sees now. I get it, yeah. my bad. Pure in a, I grew up in the forest and I genuinely believe in my heart of hearts that everybody can get along. Yes, but at the same so time, optimistic. I have seen the world and I have seen Talia turn into a tree and I understand that yeah. stakes are high. And it makes mm -hmm. the comedy mm -hmm. setups great. Like when we have this, like music drops out, you hear the like cars honking and the like CGI animals <laughs> making their noises. <laughs> it's effective. It's like it's not gonna not hit because of all of this detailed work that we've done with Grover's character writers, to prepare us. Writers, designers, for that to be a take good note. Joke. You want to make a joke land? Put an ostrich on screen. <laughs> an ostrich is an objectively <laughs> funny animal. I will laugh anytime I see it. Great choice. Low hanging fruit. Correct. I have a question about the animals. Someone I saw today said that there was no zebra in this scene there is it's in the background okay that's what i thought because the title of the episode <laughs> is we take a zebra to vegas and i was like i don't think they would not put a zebra in as one of the animals yeah. it's like it's faint like you can barely see it because i tweeted about that today and i was like is the zebra in the room with us and somebody <laughs> like sent, sent the screenshot of it and then okay. circled it Good. i was Good. like okay but it's barely there it is true that the camel's in the foreground yeah yeah <laughs> the chapter is called that in the book because Percy talks to mm -hmm. the horse. He talks to the zebra to the because zebra. the zebra is also of genus mm -hmm. Equus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two people who are <laughs> mad about exposition listening to this. If there's so much exposition, why do we know about Percy being able to talk to horses yet? Hmm? Sounds like we're saving some stuff for later. Yeah. Father of horses. <laughs> yeah, we, I know. Oh, I learned that you two were disappointed about that, Carter. I was so, I was so sad they didn't <laughs> throw that in. My favorite, my favorite of Poseidon's nicknames. So we better get the horse <laughs> conversation later on. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Do a leap of needle drop. <laughs> this must have been so expensive. This was the one place where I was like, is this cost effectiveness? Girl, like, I, I would like to see, <laughs> I would like to see some, some numbers. Interesting. Uh, to, to justify specifically levitating. It could have been brutal. Effect, like, <laughs> it could have been brutal by Olivia Rodrigo. Been brutal. Oh. Waking up in Vegas. I like, oh. I, I just feel like there's something about the, temporality of the song the fact that like the song is gonna be really expensive because every person it's gonna be really expensive i think it's the first thing, song that you think of probably if you were like say a sound design person like oh we're going to like a swanky party kind of thing what do we play under it something off of future nostalgia which song the first single i guess you know like it's the wrong number of years old i think okay, for this okay Go i ahead, did a Mike. deep i did a big deep dive on this for an instagram reel i made because i knew people were going to get mad like leading up to it, people like it's got to be poker face it's got to be poker face and i was like we got to run the numbers it's not going to make sense so when the lightning thief movie came out that was 
2010, so it was filmed in 2009. Billboard Hot 100 2009, Poker Face was number two. This mm-hmm. TV show started filming in 2022, and number one song for 2021 was Levitating. And then Levitating like had a good run early into 2022. Like There's an article written in March that said it was like had 70 straight weeks on the Hot 100, and 41 of those were in the top 10. So by the time they filmed this in mid-2022, it's still a big deal. So it's like that same kind of cultural relevancy of where Poker Face was in the world when they filmed the Lightning Thief movie and where Levitating was in the world when they filmed this song. But then you look at the lyrics of Levitating and they have that line down that says, I had a premonition that we fell into a rhythm that the music don't stop for life. And that is the Lotus Casino. So it works Uh lyrically too. So it checks the box of, okay, it was as popular as Poker Face was when they did the Lightning Thief movie. Sure, the lyrics aren't about like actual casinos and stuff like that, but it is very Lotus Casino-y in the lyrics. So Mm -hmm. I think it's a perfect selection. And mm. also the song Slap. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're not going to compare Dua Lipa and Lady Gaga as side by side on this podcast. I don't think so. I'm dead. I'm just saying the two <laughs> songs and where they were in the world. I'm not comparing the artists. I they love were not in the you might say that the chart numbers were the same for the like historical periods of time. Dua Lipa's Levitating was a big song during a global pandemic, and it's by Dua Lipa. <laughs> it is not the same cultural connotation. <laughs> I just think it works for having like a similar vibe to what the needle drop that led to Poker Face was being so iconic because it's just such a timestamp of like when that movie was made. And I agree with you, Carter, that this is kind of making it very like timely for the show. But I think it's going to yeah. have the same effect where it's like, oh, so twenty. I think it's the wrong timely, though. Mm. When I hear levitating, I think we're in the middle of the pandemic. I'm like locked in my house. I don't think it is just started being 2024. And I think that's what's weird about it. I think that if you had picked like an old song from like the early 2000s or earlier, you would be fine and in the clear. I think if you picked something, say off of Guts, you would have been free and in the clear as well. Prime pandemic songs feel like both like really old, but also still too recent. And like, we haven't been able to escape them. I think. I feel like I understand what everyone is saying. And I, I and yeah. it's weird. Mm-hmm. They specifically want this show to not feel aged and timed. Like, I feel like Tish spoke about that a lot with the costumes and like dressing Percy in that like classic flannel, you know? So like, it looks like they're kids, but they're not kids in a specific time period. But then obviously we already had Logical by Olivia Rodrigo, which sets us very firmly in 2023, 2024. And on the Jets jersey is from a player who only joined the team in 2021 in Smelly Gabe's apartment. So it can yeah. only so be Yeah, so there are like little details order. that are orienting us in the current time period already. Tweeting. He calls it Twitter, not X. So yeah, I think it does work go. with levitating. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> they obviously wrote this show sure. during 2020, 2021. It does seem like the type of song. I mean, it is the type of song that you walk into like... Any general retail area, that's what exactly. you're going to hear on the radio. Like, if you walk into the H&M, perhaps. And yeah. those songs are always <laughs> like a year or two old. That's why you still hear the Justin Timberlake Troll song at any sporting event you go to. And that's <laughs> oh why Megan Trainer is still in Target. <laughs> I guess we'll allow it. Even if I would have chosen something else, I can understand now why maybe it did get chosen. Yeah. Moving on from my mental We've health. talked about that. <laughs> 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 um, the period variants in the extras costumes rocks straight away. Super cool. mm-hmm. If there was too much exposition in the show, why didn't it get named that everybody is wearing different outfits? That That's is how real. you do exposition <laughs> not in dialogue by showing and not telling. If Good you are point. a longtime fan looking for Easter eggs, you will be able to tell very quickly that like there's a man in a very clearly 70s suit jacket talking to a woman who's dressed like she's from the 1930s and mm-hmm. they're walking right behind the trio and like yes. Percy <laughs> shouts out the graphic novel of the Odyssey, which is I mean, I was a bookseller. I'm not sure how common this knowledge is, but like the graphic novel by Gareth Hines of The Odyssey is like massively popular. It's super and popular. <laughs> massively popular. And like if you didn't get into Percy Jackson or Delaire's or Edith Hamilton, like you probably got into the graphic novel of The Odyssey. So I think that's a really cute nod here. Or if you got it assigned in school and you didn't know what was going on, you got the graphic yeah. novel to help basically know for your Shakespearing The Odyssey yeah. for you. Yeah, Mm, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. We're going into this similarly to how we went into Medusa's, like knowing what's happening on a mission, Mm -hmm. trying to get out alive. Yes. Something that I was kind of bugged by with the previous episode and then this episode was just that like I felt – They were getting rid of like the point of the Lotus Casino, like mythologically, which is that you stumble upon it. And I feel like it's just kind of the nature of the show where they have to move things along. And right off the bat, they know exactly what's going on. I was like, like, I feel like they're kind of unlotusifying the casino. But then by the end of the episode, I came around on it. This is something that I think speaks to 
what we were talking about earlier, which is like, you just kind of kind of got to wait and see what they do. And by the end of the episode, I was like, OK, it all made sense. You got the same vibes. I yeah. understand. I don't feel like anything has truly been lost here. Right. Because instead of stumbling upon it and that being the weirdness of time and space, we are going specifically to see Hermes, which is telling us that Hermes is somebody who not only exists beyond time and space, but chooses to spend his time in this weird and sad place that exists beyond time and space. What is he running from? Why is he trying to drown his sorrows in poker? Like, what is it about him and his character <laughs> that makes him so tortured? And why are we talking to him? And that is way more important to set up the entire series and what's going to happen in book five than them like stumbling upon a casino. Mm -hmm. And I also think people are underestimating for themselves how tired they would get of the visual, like the audio visual device of like every episode of the kids not knowing something that you as the viewer already know about. Yeah. Like, I think it would not, I, I think people would get really tired of like watching Annabeth be like one of the smartest demigods of her generation and be like among, like be constantly in new situations and not have any idea what's going on. Like, I don't think it would hold together and cohere. Yeah and be fun to watch right. for that And long. it's also a thing, the fun to watch angle, you have to consider, and I think the show is doing this, you have to consider making it fun to watch for people who've read the books before. It is a generative uncertainty. A lot of the things that they're changing from the books are things where if you are very, very familiar with the books, you will notice the change and you will sit there Ha like spiraling out <laughs> because of all the possibilities that they unlock. Which like, this is not right just now. a thing that they happen <laughs> to have changed. This is something where you can imagine many different cool versions of how the rest of this episode is going to go based on the fact that they have this information now. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a strength of adaptation yeah. if you can do those things without yeah. pissing people off. We have to shout out the <laughs> first canonical wise girl. We got Seaweed Brain last week. Yes. And seaweed Brain again at the beginning of this episode. And now we get Wise Girl. I have always despised that nickname because I think it's so silly. But also it works because because of course, Percy wouldn't be able to come up with a nickname as good as Annabeth. Yes, mm -hmm. it's not as good of it's a nickname. It's the same thing that I think of a backbiter. It's a terrible name for a sword, which makes it perfect for Luke, teenager who thinks he's super cool, naming his sword, <laughs> I am the bad guy, actually. Like, exactly. It's, it's a yeah. perfectly bad one. Here's a theory I wanted to ask you to, because you are so seaweed brain focused. Maybe I was reading far into it, but <laughs> the delivery that Walker gives, he kind of has a little bit of a pause between wise and girl. Do you think that was an intentional thing where like Percy kind of forces it like it's clearly a retort of like I've come up with my version of seaweed brain because it didn't sound smooth and I wonder if that was an intentional thing of like stumble a bit over this I think it's definitely not smooth I mean I don't know if who, if somebody coached Walker to do that or if right. he is intuitively Percy Jackson and he understands <laughs> but like the fact that we get two seaweed brains before we get one wise girl is very important to me because yeah. he is yeah. struggling he's been mm -hmm. struggling for the past 24 hours to think of a nickname for Annabeth I well, probably like something. 12 yeah. hours. Yeah. He's been, really, he's been cooking and turning the wheels, and this is the best he could come up with. Yeah. I think it's also worth noting. Yeah. No one could make it sound good, and that's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> Uh, of the right. Yes. <laughs> and exactly. he's so nice, he doesn't want it to be like offensive either. It's yeah. still like complimentary halfway of her. Yeah. Halfway through. Yeah. He backed out. He lost it. <laughs> Bye. Pretty girl. Um. <laughs> gazes affectionately <laughs> okay so we're going to look for hermes percy doesn't know what hermes looks like this is a good point i think you made in the outline carter that like uh we are so far not playing into the book lore that gods can change their appearance that would obviously be very confusing uh for the tv show um so uh hermes looks like lin-manuel miranda and of course that brings up the question does lin-manuel miranda exist in this universe does hamilton <laughs> not exist in the riot and verse or does hermes choose to look like Pulitzer Prize winner Lin-Manuel Miranda. I would love if it's like a weird alternate universe where it's like, you know, like Min Lanwell. Where like Hermes Miranda. actually wrote. Oh, that, no. I was going to say like, <laughs> it would be funny if there was like so close to being the same thing, but it's just like ever so slightly off. Like when you're in the Marvel multiverse and you go like one universe yeah. over and you're like, oh yeah, it's this big thing, but it's about a different historical figure. Lights up on Jackson Heights maybe this time. Sure. <gasps> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> okay. We're moving around. Percy and Annabeth one team grover on the other team this is great once again some persebething while we are also giving grover the time to really set up the pan arc which is very mm -hmm. important really the part of this episode that jumped out to me was us talking about may 
Luke's mom being a seer, mm -hmm. but we talked about this on our live stream last night that it's not just that she can see through the mist, but it's that she gets visions of the future. And this is definitely a bit of a conflation of the two things from the book, as far as I remember it. It's a conflation of the two things, but it would make sense in the sense that when Annabeth met May, they would both be happening. And it makes sense that Annabeth would conflate these two things because we haven't had Oracle transfers. Like Annabeth would not have a way of understanding. Like Annabeth doesn't know what happened to May in the sense that she doesn't know that May tried to become the Oracle and got cursed and it didn't work, right? Like she, Annabeth might only know one person who is like a mortal who can see through the mist and it's May and May also has these mm. terrifying visions okay. of the future and of the past and of prophecies. Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily a lore thing. And it is worth noting that like, we're pretty sure that Sally doesn't have this, but we are also pretty sure that Percy has this like facial express. They cut to him and have these reaction shots of him, like looking very thoughtful mm -hmm. and interested and like pondering as Annabeth is delivering this lore about May. Presumably Percy is also being like, wait, that is a thing that I'm familiar yeah. with, yeah. actually. Right, like he- More parallels between Luke and Percy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if there's too much explicit exposition, how come Percy didn't say, oh, that's like my mom, huh? Uh-huh, huh? What about <laughs> Did that? Did you think about that? What about that? <laughs> um, very important, quote, Luke blames Hermes, and I think Hermes would do anything to win him back. Obviously, this comes up later, Sea of Monsters and beyond. It is so juicy that we are doing it now, because why not? Why wouldn't yes. you want to see Hermes in this episode and start to set up the relationship with Luke. I, I think the thing about this line that's so interesting to me from Annabeth is not just like it does characterize a relationship, but it's not just what somebody might mistakenly call exposition if you're confusing exposition and uh, the delivery of relationship history as dialogue. Like the fact that Annabeth says this is also revealing to the listener that she has, how would you say, like a not incredibly sophisticated understanding of relationship dynamics. Like she is proposing this relationship as though it were a mathematical formulation. You know, like, it's a little bit clunky. It's not that nuanced. And we're going to see in the next scene that she is going to struggle to be like, okay, I've solved it. Like, I have the password. Yes. Like, let me, like, crack open Hermes for all of exactly. us. Exactly. And to have her be like, wait, why isn't this working? Okay, I guess we'll give up and do something it's else. You know, like, nature. It's just, you know, being yes. overly calculating. She really thinks that, oh, if we tell him that Luke wants to talk to him, he will talk to his son. Assuredly, he loves his son and therefore will do anything to get him back. When that's just not true. Yes. And there are like laws that Hermes has to abide by, not to mention his own emotional turmoil that make that impossible for him that Annabeth can't understand because she's not at that level of emotional understanding yet. Oh, Grover B plot, Augustus the Satyr. We get to hear Grover admit that this is something that's really important to him that he doesn't feel like he can really talk about yet with Percy and Annabeth. And maybe that's just because it's not the right time because he's a chaperone and he's the protector here. But he says, quote, it's just hard to talk to my friends about it. I don't know if they can understand and then Augustus leads him eventually right to the VR, which Carter, I know you were like, okay, but what if Pan actually does exist in virtual reality? And that is where we're going. I literally, <laughs> okay. So like when you think about where Pan actually is in the Battle of the Labyrinth, it's like pretty random and it's not plot important. Like he could be anywhere. He's just like not in an obvious part of nature, right? I think it would make perfect sense for, and, and I think like for the quest, for Pan to feel satisfying in a plot way, I think Grover has to get close at multiple points throughout the series. And this might as well be one of them. Like, I, I think it would make perfect sense for Grover to be right about this. Even if Pan doesn't literally exist in the VR headset, I think it would make sense for Grover to actually be unlocking a meaningful clue at this moment in time yeah. that we will be able to lock into place in a future season. That he's going to be somewhere that you wouldn't expect him to be. And I think Pan being in a video game makes perfect sense. Like a Black Mirror, like he put an image of himself there, but he's actually been dead this whole time, right? Do we not see the video? Yeah, I, I see, see it. Vision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see it. I don't think they'll do it, but I see it. I see what I you're see doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it hasn't been written yet. They could it's, do it. Yep. Speaking yeah, into existence. Something, something. Yeah. AI happen. is uncharted <laughs> natural territory and it's unexplored, uh, uh, like right. the wilds. <laughs> <laughs> if we're doing a deal with meta, maybe that's where uh, we go. Uh, okay, well, maybe not that. <laughs> <laughs> Percy recounts his dream to Annabeth. This dialogue is absolutely fire. If I tell you something, do you promise not to make fun of me? Leah goes, dude, that, is, <laughs> that line delivery meant so much to me. I loved the, there are things I don't know. And it was just a great line from Annabeth. But then Percy follows it up with, yeah, but if you don't know, what chance do I have? Which yes. is just further showing <laughs> that he is You're better than really me. fond mm -hmm. of her and mm -hmm. he's dropping any sense of pride or anything like that. Like he has the humility of, yeah, this girl knows what she's doing. We saw it in episode five where mm -hmm. he says, you're better at this than I am. You know, you just got to admit it. 
And then he says this again here. And I think it's really nice to see. And it's a characteristic of Percy that I really liked in the books. And I think that that is translating well over into the show yeah. where like he's self-confident when it comes to like, let me try to pick a fight with Ares. But also at the same time, he recognizes, yeah, maybe I'm not the best person in every single situation. And yes. I just, I love that line yeah. and the reply so much. So much. Yeah. And I know that the show is called mm -hmm. Percy Jackson and the Olympians, but it really feels like Percybeth and the Olympians at this point because of how much <laughs> them having these like duo scenes now for two episodes in a mm -hmm. row and like really establishing that they're a team and that they have strengths and weaknesses that complement one another. We are already so far into the development of that dynamic as a partnership. We've talked a little bit about this with the fates cutting the string, et cetera, that Annabeth could become more of a player in the prophecy than she is in the book. Like if Annabeth is the true foil to Luke and not even Percy being the true foil to Luke, that would be so cool. I think it's great that we have the opportunity to develop Annabeth as like really the main character of the story just as much as Percy, even though her name isn't technically in the title. You know, mm -hmm. it really shows how much like they changed him from the books and like they gave him the knowledge of all of these stories. And it's not just Annabeth telling him everything, but it still balances it out with he doesn't know what to do with that information yet. So like he knows the stories, he knows what's going on. But Annabeth is the one that applies it, basically. Like mm -hmm. She's yeah. like, oh, mm -hmm. OK, that's that's why this. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. why he was asking for advice on his yeah. dream. Like he didn't understand what it meant yet and i was hoping she would because so far she's known what to do and so she's like yeah i don't know things and he's like oh oh okay <laughs> <laughs> oh real 12 minutes and 30 seconds people are claiming you can hear a small child yelling bianca bianca in the background i fully believe it let me be clear that i will believe any nico bianca conspiracy brought yeah. to my attention in this episode 100 <laughs> i believe it all I personally yes. couldn't hear it, but maybe I'm just too old I and it's like it. that thing where you turn a certain age, you can't I hear it. It's a dog whistle. It is a little kid's high-pitched voice, so it makes sense. It's a dog whistle that you can only hear if Titan's Curse is your favorite book written by Rick Riordan. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah I like so I like there was somebody made a point on twitter of like why would a background actor if it is just noise why would a background actor yell at the top of their lungs and them not cut it out and i was yeah. like yeah that's a good point mm -hmm. that's a pretty mm -hmm. good point Ooh, like you yeah. would have a background actor scream and then someone yeah. on production like jet wouldn't be like hi uh whoever just screamed can you just not yeah we're gonna retake yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay um we're gonna take a quick commercial break here before we meet lynn all right, welcome back. We're in Act 2, a.k.a. it's time to go and see Hermes. We open on the shot of Lynn in this, what is now going to be an iconic it's beige nice hoodie. hoodie. It's um, one of those yeah. very expensive looking hoodies. It's such an interesting choice to dress him like a hype beast from Southern California or like a dad who like has a lot of money and not a lot of stuff to mm -hmm. do with it. You can tell by the material that it's probably like a yeah. $500 hoodie, which is just it one looks of those expensive. Like, weird things where it's like, it's not necessarily a yeah. blazer or a bomber mm -hmm. jacket or whatever, but it's as expensive yeah. as one of those would be. So I think it is a really good choice. And then pairing it with yeah. a very shiny, very big gold watch. And then also, very expensive the, watch. I don't know what the name of that mm -hmm. kind of bracelet is, but one of those, you know, like link chain bracelet on his other wrist. Mm -hmm. I think it was intentional. And and, and mm -hmm. definitely because the watch comes into play. When I first saw it, I was like, that is a huge, shiny watch. I guess Hermes is a watch guy. But then later yeah. on, he does the very much like, hmm. And the I got to just say, speaking <laughs> of that particular moment, Lin-Manuel Miranda's eyebrow acting is phenomenal in here. It reminded me of School it's of true. Rock when it's Jack true. Black does like the wave outside the doorway. Like mm -hmm. him and Leah, like the eyebrow acting in this <laughs> cast. <laughs> yes. <And Glenn's laughs> eyebrow, Mike, like, you're spoiling my award. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> You can still nominate it. Also, not to mention Walker's eyebrows when we're underwater at the end of this episode. Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. Also doing a lot of work. Really cool. Really cool. Outstanding yes. eyebrow acting. Annabeth says, we're friends of Luke's. The way his face darkens is crazy. His face well immediately shot. darkens. Wow. And Annabeth really says it like, this is, I'm ending the conversation we're having right now. And we're like shifting to do something else, which is which ends up being what happens. But I think it's also mm -hmm. reflective of this thing we were talking about earlier of her having a more mechanical, let's say, understanding of human motivation. There was a lot of appearances by people who have like worked on the show or friends and family from what I've gathered in this episode. This shot is we're like slow zooming onto the table where Hermes is sitting with Persebeth. Uh, you can see Daphne Olive's daughter on the right hand side in like mm -hmm. a little 70s outfit, which is really cool. Um, and I know that there's a bunch of other cameos. I know 
Lynn posted about bringing his son mm-hmm. to set. So Literally, cool. it's like, bring your kid to work day to be an extra <laughs> in the Lotus Hotel and Casino. That is so Dan and John. God, I love this fandom. And we're so lucky to have nice people leading this show. It's really nice. Yeah. Okay. Carter, you have taken a lot of notes on this. Please yes, proceed. Yes, we're, we're <laughs> off inside Rome with Hermes. Um, the set design is fascinating. Like, I, I'm still a little struggling to understand why. Behind... Uh, Hermes, there's like a glowing glass, I want to say impressionist landscape with a lot of like light blues and greens that is providing a lot of the lighting in the scene, even though it's behind him. And to the right of Percy and Annabeth and left of Hermes, like on the wall next to them, they have this gigantic sort of like full wall shelf of huge, nice decorative pieces from like greco-roman antiquity it's a lot of like helmets mm-hmm. breastplates one of the helmets pottery. is a hercules helmet i learned this just because the monster donut folks were on tno <laughs> yes and like found you can that you can get that particular one on etsy for like a thousand dollars but there's only one left so act fast uh she said that and then one of the pots was like her favorite <laughs> like jar that's got like an octopus and stuff on it that's in a museum in Athens. So there were some things that were like general, mm. but then also some like very intentional choices. For very the specific which choices. Which just shows so much care yeah. into the, every shot. Oh, Dan, <laughs> Hannah. It makes you think like, mm, is this the weird little corner of the Lotus Hotel and Casino where Hermes takes all of his meetings with the yes, distressed yes, probably. demigods? Uh-huh. Probably, yeah. This is where he <laughs> pretends to be helpful. This is his office hours location. And was yeah. he doing this just to mess with Percy or were, was he doing this because he intentionally wants to throw people off because they're Luke's friends in quotes? It's uh, lots of questions about Hermes' actions yes. here. Oh, what was he drinking? What's the beginning <laughs> half of the joke he was telling? Yeah. Someone mm-hmm. did DM me on Instagram that I think it's like a Yiddish joke and they had explained it, but then Instagram did that thing when like you message someone that I think it cut it off after a certain amount of characters. So I still didn't get the full explanation of the joke, <laughs> even though I was trying. Oh, interesting. This scene, what, what are we seeing here? We're seeing at a high level that this is our first reasonable, I'm doing air quotes here, visual medium. This is our first reasonable Olympian take on parenting. Like Lynn is giving you understated, confused, tormented, but I I think this is the first time we we are supposed to try to understand from the God's perspective why they treat their kids the way they do. And if there is any, like if there's going to be any justification, if there's anything we can understand about that behavior, this is going to be the time where we're going to get a glimpse into that. You can see like Annabeth really is sort of like not at the place where she is locked into that. Like she is trying to push his buttons and extract as much usefulness from him as possible. And is like clearly starting to get really frustrated. Whereas Percy, I think like he wants to get the stuff. Like there, there's an exchange where Hermes says, you don't want my help. Trust me. And Percy responds, no, we actually kind of do. The emotional <laughs> shift when he says that line though, like you can tell he's truly hurt by some of the people he has tried to help out that haven't made it out. It was really nice to see no like and and this is the thing is like percy and like the audience i think are actually clued into hermes as someone who is genuinely emotionally tormented is making valid points and has in fact caused meaningful harm to people in his life by by being present as a figure who is dangerous and can't control what will happen to the people that he interacts with as much as he has caused harm in ways that he is not he's choosing not to focus on right now by you know neglecting people and (laughs) <laughs> shirking yeah. his responsibilities it's really giving weird and sad dad avoiding his family at the casino who is very convinced he's right and maybe because we're young and we don't know everything we should believe him i think percy also is like really seriously listening to hermes and there's this moment where after hermes does the like hand touch like flash thing it's a really short flashback but you can see in that moment that percy is genuinely putting himself in yeah. hermes's position which is important for yeah. a number of reasons it's just like baseline empathy but it is also fitting into our idea about Percy as a character exploring this in-between state where like Percy is someone who is bringing in moral understandings from a like grounded, empathetic, very humanistic perspective, but has to contend with the fact that he has power. He has this privilege that comes with being a child of the big three and literally being able to like metaphysically enact huge changes upon the world without even necessarily wanting to all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, he can relate to Hermes in this situation because, like, in the relationship that he has with Sally, he is looking back on those things and realizing that he is that, like, big, powerful, destructive force in her life. Yes. The line, do you know what that's like to be so close to someone you love, knowing neither of you has any choice but to keep hurting each other? 
this is so written by a bunch of parents. My first thought was Sally and Poseidon and how excited I am to like see whatever they're cooking up with the whole much alluded to Sally Poseidon backstory scene. Mm -hmm. My second thought was my relationship with my mom in high school and like <laughs> how terrible it is to just be like a kid sometimes. It is really great and it grounds it right back to the whole this is a family story. Yes. We may be in a fantasy setting, but ultimately that's what parenting is. Yes. And also, to these people who can't sit through any relationship development, it's not just relationship development is the other thing, is that all of this is seamlessly integrated. Like, he, he's reliving these emotional experiences because this is the lens through which he's making the decision about whether or not to help them. Like, he is seeing, again, a situation where he could choose to get involved and make himself available and emotionally invest in Percy and Annabeth in this situation, or he could go with his instinct, which is to say, I'm going to withdraw and be detached and try to protect you by not allowing you to get the things that you want to progress the way that you want to. And by like affiliating myself with you and bringing you closer into the, you know, like world of Olympian divinities, even if it would be with his help as a very powerful chaperone. I, I think the way that they, they are able to, to, thread those two things together, but without making it feel like an after-school special is hard. I don't think people generally appreciate how difficult it is to write and then play the emotional beats of going back and forth and having like Hermes like get these requests for help and then immediately turning it back around to being about Luke and have that not feel jarring and wrong, but instead feel like extra yeah. emotionally resonant and like you're getting an actual deep glimpse and read into how he yeah. works as like the first like three-dimensional Olympian, let's say, that we've really gotten to encounter. I mean, it's genius. Putting Hermes in the scene was so smart because you're hitting not only referencing Annabeth's mm -hmm. relationship with her parent, referencing Percy's relationship with his mom, maybe even referencing Percy's mom's relationship with his dad, referencing Hermes' relationship with Luke, but then also representing like what is the overarching like concept of what we get at the end of The Last Olympian, and then also how are we going to get to the underworld? Mm -hmm. like, putting him here right now has taken care of so many things in one tiny conversation. It's also mythological accurate yeah it's also <laughs> gonna make the setup in sea of monsters interesting if we do get the hermes helping out percy with mm, the yellow mm -hmm. bags before going to the princess amadromeda because then it's going to be a little more of like okay maybe he's trying to actively help us out this time he as opposed to, to the be previous active. time where he didn't yes. want to help us out like it's yeah. more interestingly yes. setting up the next time percy and hermes yeah. are going to interact with each other especially because it would make sense like if we see hermes right now in his state of being and then luke you know, goes off the rails at the end of this season. And then Hermes comes uh, back in season two being like, yeah. oh, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I should have mm -hmm. intervened. Or like, okay, now I understand that it gets to a certain point. The line that we end the scene on, which is just so good. They really cooked with this one. And I know whoever wrote this was typing it out and being like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I just did that. <laughs> um, it was your father who warned me to stay away, said it was awful watching you struggle and feel powerless to stop it. But that sometimes that's what parenting is. Mm-hmm. The key word, I think, in that sentence is sometimes. Yeah, because sometimes parenting is like doing the easy thing and being there for your children. But yes, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think that Hermes will come to realize once Luke is, you know, trying to start a war that will end the entire universe that sometimes <laughs> yeah. you do have to yeah. intervene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hermes isn't saying even that this is like normatively correct. He's saying it is emotionally difficult for him to be in a situation where he has to watch his children struggle with things that he feels like there are answers to. Does that mean that you shouldn't do it? Girl. <laughs> but um, we, we have that. We have Percy trying to reconcile this. There are a lot of good cutback shots between Hermes and Percy in this scene where Percy is, again, like coming in this very strong, still has that firm sense of grounding normatively in what's supposed to happen, but is also like genuinely trying to follow, empathize. And then we get the actual final, final moment in this where Hermes says, oh, too late. He does that long, <laughs> long, drawn out look at the humongous watch, does his little gird face, and then we <laughs> run out to figure out. Okay, the details in this are a little bit ambiguous. It looks like the conclusion is that it is the day of the deadline, right? Like it is currently the solstice. And like if we really hurry up in the Lotus Casino, we might be able to make it in time. Yes. Yeah. It, it's still at the moment that Percy and Annabeth are like debriefing at the front lobby of the hotel it is i think still possible for them to do everything in time but it's tight and it would be really really difficult 
for everything to work out. I was confused at first how they get to the lobby and then they suddenly realize what's going on. But then I assumed it was A, because they're like further out of the casino. So like they're starting Whatever to- Whatever Hermes brought them. Yeah. 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 Or also because of the whole, like there's no windows in casinos thing. So like when they get to the <laughs> glass doors, they like, yeah. oh, they're jolted into understanding oh, what day it is. And I think that's yeah. what it was because at first when they were doing that, I was like, because they show the door for a long time. I was like, yeah. is this person who's entering important? Like, is, yeah, this like, is there a date know? somewhere? Is there a calendar is attached to this on? car? But no, yeah. I think I think it's twofold. It's like you can see the time and then also you can see that no one is leaving. Only people are entering. So it's just, that I think also it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Also very quickly, I did find the joke uh, because the person oh. was able to link it. It's a Yiddish joke and it basically says like a grandmother loses her baby at the beach when a tidal wave sweeps the baby away. So she she prays, please, God, I've always been a good person and a loving grandmother. Please return my grandson to me. And then a wave crashes back on the beach, returning the boy. And then she cries, hugs her grandson, is overcome with joy, and then looks at her grandson, looks back at the sky and yells, he had a hat. So the <laughs> wrong baby was returned. So I think that's the joke. Uh, oh, you know. interesting. Yeah. Lynn, let us know if that's the full joke. <laughs> yeah, let us know. We also maybe see Bianca and Nico. At this was a Hannah special. Oh, another one? It is not exclusively me. That it, I saw somebody else say it first. And then I was like, but I also like that was my first thought when I saw them, when I watched it. And other people said the same thing. And I was like, okay, I'm not crazy. I believe every conspiracy. I believe <laughs> our friend Sophia's theory that they planted several pairs of tiny siblings just to throw us off and to make oh, parents yeah. go nuts. Yeah, I'm oh, sure yeah. that's that's more likely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, somebody told the extras casting director for the scene to pick out like every sibling duo they could find in Vancouver who auditioned to come <laughs> to the Lotus Every Hotel. Canadian boy with black hair now. <laughs> yeah, here's where we get, you picked Hermes's pocket and Annabeth going, I'm multi-talented. <laughs> So yes. I rewatched it. Did you notice that when she kind of leaves the conversation that she takes the Yankees hat out of her pocket before yes, she yeah, makes yeah, 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 yeah. There's like, yeah. It's, You can really so see the, like, yeah, her from behind as she's leaving. It's it's great. I wanted to hear George and Martha, like, do something oh, on the little keychain. Key oh, yeah, because they had the close-up on the keychain with the Caduceus. Yeah. yeah. Um, or even just a little wiggle. Yeah, just a little wiggle or like that they would be like swirling around each other or something. But we can save that yeah. for a later season. We'll save. Yeah, we can't cast George and Martha this early. You know, like it's, <laughs> it's going to be a long five seasons. We got to go pick up Grover, which we only remember because we see like some random Augustus. other satyr. Th this is the like, set pieciest thing maybe that we have yeah. in the casino, which is this like fun chase scene that lasts for like three seconds maybe of Percy chasing down Augustus who like... We got some like great close up shots of like the hooves like clomping down on the different card tables. It's cute. It's fun. But then we go pick up Grover. Grover's in the headset. It's just sad. It's very sad. The whole thing is very sad. It looks like he's in like a weird corner of like a weird convention center. Yes. Ooh, convention mm -hmm. center. That's right. In the book, he's like in a little like hunting game where he's a deer shooting the humans, right? Oh, such a fun mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> and here he's playing the video game, but he's searching for Pan. I was so close. <laughs> Percy goes, I hate it when someone does that to me. <laughs> little gamer boys and their little video <laughs> games. And then Grover is like in his little silly, like, what's going on? I don't like I am baby um, for the rest of the episode, <laughs> which is cute and serves, as we said earlier, the idea that it's easier to forget when you're alone. Yeah, I do like that Percy said, we are Percy and Annabeth, we're your best friend. Yeah. yeah, it's really cute and sets us up for the parallelism at the end. I just found this very cute. It's so endearing. He does such a good job. But with that, that's commercial break. Act three, we're in the parking Time lot. Time for what we're all here for, actually. <laughs> you think there isn't enough action in this show and there's too much exposition? Explain this seven minute long incredible set piece in this car that assuredly took a lot of money and effort and energy and stunt people to make happen. It was awesome. It was Mark so Twain cool. prize for American comedy. Th mm. This is one of the funniest things to happen in television. I actually haven't so seen cool. Carter laugh Stop. this hard in a very long time. <laughs> From our was... lives, Carter was dying last it's night. It's the most I've laughed at anything in the show. It's not the montage we expected, but it is the one we needed. Is good. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Because really, really once again, does anything cool happen in a casino? No. Unless no. you're going to see Cirque du Soleil or a magic show or Britney Spears. No. Cool stuff doesn't happen in casinos. The real harrowing task at hand is in the parking lot. Yeah. And a cool thing about the parking lot is similar to the extras and the background actors being dressed in different eras. The cars are from different eras as well. Yes. And I know yes. another Nico nod people were pointing out is there's like an mm -hmm. all matte black car that kind of looks like, like it a would be from vibe. the right time period. Yeah. So yeah. Another... It's like 
the Central car Island. from like 1947 or something the year that they're supposed to be trapped in the casino oh like the i year love that, they that. Go in. yeah i thought that was pretty cool that it was the exact year okay see i believe that too i believe that was intentional you can't tell me that's not intentional <laughs> but then, then um, they were like it's also matt black which is nico's color because he's the son of the lord of the dead the license plate was m-t-h-o-m-g-c for mytho <laughs> <laughs> That would have been really funny. <laughs> oh, oh, are we late because of me, Grover line? Oh. Also, Grover's line of, I still don't know what's going on, so I think that's disqualifying. Is yeah. So good. I like want him to be the drive. person who makes the most sense to drive. He's the oldest. He keeps talking about how he's 24. But it's also funny that he used that excuse that he didn't know what they were doing instead of the fact that he literally has, he has hooves. hooves. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. That, that's the classic improv comedy thing yeah. of like, think of yeah. the first joke, A to C. throw it A out. To C. Exactly. Yeah. Mike and I come mm-hmm. from the same world. <laughs> I respect a good A to C. You got an A to C. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, Percy and Annabeth were your best friends, but maybe that's also a little bit of a nod to the fact that they don't really know what's going on in Grover's life right now. You know, we've yeah. spent two episodes mm-hmm. with Grover being alone yeah. and they need to ask a little bit more and show a little bit more interest in the searcher's license, you know? Yeah. Also, maybe it's helping us to set up the sentimentality so that when Grover is gone and alone and in trouble in the second season, we're like, oh, we really owe it to Grover Yay. to show up for Grover right now because of the way Grover showed up for us in season one. I'm so fascinated. And I think that's another fun thing about them bringing in some later series stuff and taking things in different directions. How they do see of monsters will be so fascinating because I think by nature of the TV show, it's a little different than the book where in the book, it was kind of like, at least to me, it felt okay. We've kind of swapped out Grover and put in Tyson for this one. But I feel like with the show, it's going to make more sense to kind of like still be promoting like the trio as the trio just makes sense from like a marketing perspective. So I feel Mm -hmm. like they're still going to have Grover be a very present part of the story. Even mm-hmm. though, yeah, empathy yeah. for sure. And and not just be yeah. like in the book where I feel like it's like Grover heavy in the beginning and then Grover heavy in the end. And in the middle, we don't get any Grover. I feel like they're going to find a way to bring it throughout the story. And yeah. I'm just really excited to see how they do see if monsters based on what they're doing here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, also it's based like, on the pirate of it all and the, yeah. and the black sails of it all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. true. And again, it's a TV show, so they can go to other perspectives. So they can mm-hmm. go to Grover's perspective instead of just like relying on Percy's point of view. Of like the empathy link or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I could see it being like first two episodes, it's just like us getting there. And then from like the third yeah. through the eighth episode, the B plot of every episode is Grover in the cave and we're checking yeah. in with him, you know, in every single episode. Mm-hmm. Ah, the note says to the dumb kids. Mm. <laughs> That's really sweet. It's very dad. It's very dad. I think, yeah, th- this is important for highlighting Hermes's ambivalence and also making like, I-, I think people would be upset if Annabeth pickpocketed him and he did not give any indication that he knew what had happened. I think yeah. the continuity would, would be off. Not only did he know that it happened, but he definitely respects it a little bit. Yes. Yeah. This is giving us many different potential openings where like, you could see him being like impressed by their childhood trickery because Hermes, of course, was a childhood trickster. But also, like, I don't know. It's everything. It's the ambivalence. It's the um, confusion. It's the respect. Yeah. It's the, like, can't bringing himself to like truly deny them and again it will be very interesting when in sea of monsters we have percy and hermes talking again because now it's not just like this is the first time we've met it's we had a bit of a contentious meeting you stole something from me but then Mm. i did still help you because i knew it was happening i'm so fascinated and then the extra intrigue on top of it are we gonna get running track star hermes like is lin manuel gonna be in the richard simmons outfit that (laughs) is basically described in the book like like, he obviously what, loves a sweatsuit. I think we're going to see him in a variating... Richard Simmons outfit. <laughs> well, that's how I always envisioned it in, in the book. It's like short shorts and, you know, running shoes and a headband, I think is how he's described, like uh, curly hair. I picture Jason Sudeikis in the What's Up With That sketch. Oh, <laughs> in like a Beastie Boys Adidas track suit. Look, whatever it is, we've gotten a lot of fun costumes already for Hermes, <laughs> where we had UPS delivery Hermes, and then we have expensive hoodie casino Hermes. We might get running Hermes. We can have like a whole Ken doll line of Hermeses by the end of this show. It's going to be another sweatsuit. It's going to be a good, nice sweatsuit. Maybe he'll actually be yeah. sweating, though, you know, like some, some pit stains vibes. <laughs> Go run a lap, Lynn, and then film this scene. Yeah. Hose him down like they hose down every other member of this cast. <laughs> <laughs> As much as I want to break down beat for beat why the comedic timing of this scene works so well, I won't do that. But I will say the whole, I killed the Minotaur on my first try, how hard could this be? 
throws the keys in the air, sound effect of catching the keys, cut to slamming into the pillar is just Good. brilliant. The another, timing of that is so smart. Another perfect one is that he has no idea how to drive, but then he gets cut off by someone and then has such a <laughs> genuine reaction to like exactly how <laughs> Sally Jackson it? must. The delayed, yes, yes. The he yells at, them, yells at them, says he didn't stop, which is such like a yeah. dad thing. Like that guy didn't even stop. Then the delayed <laughs> honk. And it makes so much sense because Percy's never driven, so he doesn't know how to drive, but he has been in the car when Sally has Sally. Sally has for mm-hmm. sure done this to someone else and Percy is like oh this is what you do when someone does something you don't like on the road it's ah it's so good it's so good yes <laughs> the it's best like- moment of this is is like the delightful Percy Beth moment when it seems like Percy has maybe actually learned how to drive you like the music is like swelled we've had the staccato da, 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 da. we're up we've like crescendo we've hit it the music has faded out because we've succeeded in our quest they're, they're staring into each other's eyes it looks great we like had a moment of like connection and growth and then there's a shot from Percy's perspective looking at Annabeth smiling at him and then from behind you see the wall appear and then slap. It's so perfect. The mirror falls off, the thing spark. And then the music flies back in. Especially with the Tunnel of Love last week, it really feels like amusement theme park ridification of these scenes just because it's Disney and you never know what they're going to turn into a component of Epcot. Like that feeling when you're like, oh, we're done, we're out of the ride before the last drop, which is the spark's flying on the side of the wall. It's so smart. Everything about this. And speaking of amusement park ride, it's very test track what happens next, (laughs) which is when (laughs) they go out and then they're about to get hit by the truck, but then they get out just in the nick of time. Yeah. (laughs) Oh God, it's so funny. It's just that moment of Persebeth smiling at each other is the most like adolescent (laughs) <laughs> incredible like oh my god you did it like wow am i like impressed by the fact that you're like navigating this parking lot right now like am i having like feelings because you can drive there's like a full horror movie orchestral hit the first yes. time you see the shot from the dashboard <laughs> yes. the turn in the <laughs> Oh, God. Really and hitting those weird bendy things, you know? That was a really good thing, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was really satisfying because I've always been tempted to drive over them because <laughs> I just want to, like, see what happens. So I'm glad I got to vicariously live through the stunt driver. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Yes. Oh, guys, this is so good. It made me think of every theatrical car driving scene ever. It made me think of Back to the Future. Back to the Future, the stops and starts, yeah. It is cinema. It's so cinema to put kids in a car and be like, just watch, isn't it funny? We've all been there. And it is. We're saved from having to get insurance information from this giant truck by being poofed into Santa Monica. As soon as we get there, it's pouring rain. We're soaking wet again. (laughs) Carter, how do we know it's Santa Monica? Dim Ferris wheel lights in the background that are super out of focus. Literally, that's how we know. (laughs) If there's so much exposition, why don't we get Santa Monica named here again? Yeah. Why is no one like, oh, we're in Santa Monica. Why weren't we like walking down a pier? Hmm? Yeah. Why is the pier just in the distance? <laughs> because it's more dramatic for Percy to walk into the ocean than to jump in. I know. And that scene is gorgeous. You got to get that wide shot of him walking. Oh, yes. Grover, Percy, and Annabeth, wait, you guys are my best friends. We're stronger when we're together. The power of friendship. This is maybe the most painful, and by painful, I mean delightful, Percy Beth <laughs> moment that we have had, which is Percy being like, what do I say to him? And Annabeth looking, they're like standing in a line. So she's looking over to the side up at him and saying, you'll know. And that hurts me because (laughs) what we talked about last week with whether or not Percy was dead when he was trapped in the gold and could hear what Annabeth was saying, likelihood is not. He does not know yet the depth to which she respects him. And can you like imagine how he will feel as somebody who respects her so much and thinks she's the smartest person he knows when he finds out that she respects him. And that's a little bit of this here where she is like, I trust you enough and I believe in you enough. And I inherently know you to be a smart enough person that you will know what to say when you get there. (laughs) Yes. It's a transfer of like, this is like about the godly domain, which is why he's looking to Annabeth and her saying like, you don't need me for this anymore is important. The idea of Annabeth Basically being like your your like relational understandings, your aspirations, your instincts about your relationship with your parents is like better than mine and something that I am aspiring to now. So I'm not going to try to, you know, give you advice about that. It's yeah. great. We've been on a journey to get to this point. It's very satisfying. Mm-hmm. Feels correct. And uh, the, the the rising of the scoring where we have this like turbulent like string ostinato with like bill and cello lines like rising as we get the like rising piccolo line so that there's like a richness it's turbulent it's giving 
people who understand how to correctly score a nautical scene, which we know that these showrunners are those kinds of people. You know that Bear McCreary knows how to do that. It's great. Oh, and then we're in the ocean. We're supposed to be seeing Poseidon. It's a Nereid. It's a mermaid. It's somebody who has like similar CGI designs kind of at a high level, maybe to the person that we saw in the Mississippi River, but there were like key differences. There's like all this like green kelpie stuff happening and like the actual like, design of the face is fascinating there are like these shots that are just like the face and she looks like she's uh, can somebody describe the art style she looks like she's painted but i don't have good enough art history to be like, like this you is said, like a watercolor carter or like yeah. impressionist it looks vaguely it, impressionist it looks iridescent it looks vaguely... for sure like a pearl yeah 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 she definitely looks like a person but you can tell like it's slightly different than you know, you can tell they're not just like trying to make a CGI lady. You know, there is clearly an artistic vision behind her design. And it just looked mm -hmm. cool and intriguing. And I like the thing that they've kind of kept from the book, which is in the book, Percy notes that her voice sounds similar to Sally's. And yeah. when I was watching this with my wife, she pointed out like, is that the same voice actress who does Sally? And I was like, oh, I wonder if that's an intentional thing that they like tried to make her sound like Sally. Because that's a thing mm -hmm. that was... Yeah. explicitly mentioned by narrator Ooh. Percy in the book. Oh, we should ask. Mm -hmm. We're going to ask Stuart. We'll ask Stuart about that. <laughs> I loved the hair. Oh, the hair I loved the hair. The hair was yeah. giving the Little Mermaid live mm -hmm. action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we get our final moments of exposition, which there weren't that many of in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> she is really not too to many. Us. She she just explains two things. It takes like ten seconds if you um have the attention span to sit through that. Where she lets us know that Solstice deadline has passed, which means that Poseidon's like preparing for war. I was floored. That's Whoa. a gag. People yeah, was gag. at our watch party were upset. They were confused. They didn't it's know what was great, going though. on. This is what I'm saying. They're doing things to keep the readers who are watching the show on edge and still feel that same suspense. And I love mm -hmm. that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. And it makes yes. so much more sense if what we are trying to prevent by the end of the season is not as much this little war, but is much more focused on the big war. That mm -hmm. the big yes. war is still yeah. brewing and the big war is much more focused than the war between Poseidon and Zeus. Right. And that's yes. why they would want to continue to go through with it, because, you know, even Neri says, like, you're released from your quest. And Percy says no, because he recognizes, like, quest, we've left, we've left quest way behind. Like, we're on to mm -hmm. next steps here. Like, yeah. there's bigger stuff mm -hmm. going on. Exactly. And I also really think this connects back to what Hermes says earlier in the episode. About sometimes even gods will feel powerless. They got were put in this position where they felt like they were going to save the world if they finished this quest and they're demigods so they have the ability to do that. But then, oh, turns out you got put in a situation where all that power was taken away from you, the deadline passed, and you are helpless to stop the war. You're like, oh, all of a sudden, I don't have that power in my grasp anymore. Uh, 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 what do I do with it when I get it back? How do I get it back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we get the four pearls. Go save your mother. Ooh, I love that the entire ocean is like rooting for Sally, you know? Yeah, they ship to Sally. It's crazy. They absolutely do. I feel like Poseidon's other wives also ship to <laughs> Sally. They're like, you know what? She's worth it. Queen amongst mortals. Best of wives, best of women, you know? Yeah. Can. Little little closing question about John Steinberg's tetrahedron of Prissy Jackson showmaking. The man, the myth, the legend, our showrunner, has said that He's trying to make a, four different kinds of shows in one. A show for kids, a show for adults, a show for fans, and a show for people who have never encountered Percy Jackson before. How do you feel like this episode is succeeding at that? I'm going to lean more towards on the people who've never encountered Percy Jackson because I have a friend in real life. She's like late 20s, I think, and she's been watching it on her own and like has never read the books, doesn't know anything about it. So she's been texting me as she watches and she's like, I'm really impressed with this show because it's kept my attention the entire time. I'm not confused about anything. The only thing I'm confused about is like what each Greek god is, like what's their thing, which like that makes sense. Sometimes you have to look up what that Greek god is for. So I think that really shows like for younger viewers too, it keeps your attention so well because it's not like constantly just throwing information at you. You're seeing it and they're explaining it in ways that make sense and it's concise and it's not drawn out. And I think it's doing a great job. And so this episode, they did, again, with the scene with Hermes, they put so much in that one scene. You get so many backstories in one, things that are implied, things you're looking forward to in the future. So 
I think it's doing great. It's been really cute to see all of my like normal friends be excited about this. I know, <laughs> me too. People who like have no relationship with it. it that's been really special. And like my family is watching yeah, it, too. you know, my cousins are watching it. It's really, it's really sweet. The family getting in the mix is great. My parents watched the first couple with me because I was home for the holidays yeah, and stuff. Exactly. And then we exactly. had, we had family who came in after Christmas that had not watched the first two episodes. So I think when episode three came out, we couldn't watch it. And my parents were fuming. <laughs> Other relatives ruined like our Tuesday night activity. We oh can't watch the next show because you haven't seen the first. Day. They were so upset. I was so happy. I was so happy. <laughs> okay, now it's time for everybody's favorite moment of the evening: episode six Naughty Awards. This is where we award moments in the show. Everybody is going to give a nomination and an award, and then we're going to choose one for uh, the listeners to vote on on Spotify. So, if, does anybody <laughs> is anybody ready to kick us off here? I love the PCHH inspiration. Clearly, in that that delivery. Erica. Thank you. I, I am nothing if not Glenn Weldon's number one stand. Mine is for the outstanding use of eyebrow acting. I'm giving it to Leah Save Jeffries because every episode she has a moment where her eyebrows shoot up and it's perfect. And she does so well, but with a special shout out to Lynn with his in this episode as well. Absolutely. Not to mention Walker's underwater eyebrows, of course. Similarly in the facial acting category, the is going to the twinkle in Walker's eye for the most fascination <laughs> a 12-year-old boy has ever had for another 12-year-old girl. It is absolutely adorable and inspiring to see the way that he is so confused and fascinated by her and learning from her at every step of the way. Um, and this especially comes to pass when she steals the keys in this episode. I will nominate the writers and showrunners for the one-two punch of we got them folks as they tricked all of the book readers watching the show and not necessarily tricked they got them with we too can make you feel stressed and suspenseful for the stressful suspenseful part of the show the one-two punch of you've missed the deadline and there's four pearls just right at the <laughs> end of the episode making all of the people who thought they knew the story go no nah! and feel like the mr krabs spinning coming out of yes. focus me, like what are you talking about it's supposed to be three pearls and the deadline isn't here yet oh it's great i love it and they are doing a good job of making people who think they know what's happening recognize we don't know what's happening perfect where's uh, absolutely where's robert he needs to make the meme right now oh yeah robert can make it for us thank you he'll, robert he'll that it. one was for robert. you the good old robert freebie mm. <laughs> I, I would like to give the the Nodi award for the mark twain prize for american comedy which i believe i've given previously yes In this episode it is specifically going to go to the editing team across sound and the like literal cutting of clips for the way that the scoring and the ascent up the parking lot ramp happen mm -hmm. absolute yes. american comedy i cannot emphasize enough it's so funny mm -hmm. so funny so good. what are we going to nominate for the listeners to vote on this week should we do mm -hmm. which one is actually nico and bianca <laughs> oh my god <laughs> let's do that yes is it the audio one is it the people that han had clocked is it the yes. car <laughs> is there any other option is it the 1947 hearse yeah mm -hmm. or is it like any other number of uh sibling duos that that people have pointed out yeah or yeah you can see you can bet on the house so it's any anything else that was not mentioned <laughs> okay perfect perfect um make sure you if you're listening on spotify go ahead and vote in the poll thank you all thank you mike and han for just a incredibly long recording with us tonight um, and spending your evening with us. Listeners, I hope we enjoyed. I hope um, the two people who are also on TikTok and listen to this podcast, you're still here with us. We can be friends even if we have different yeah. opinions. That's what podcasts are about. Listen, we are we are the biggest haters on the planet. You will not out-hater us. That's not what this is about. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And next week, it's 11 o'clock number time, everybody. It's the penultimate. <gasps> Wild. Wild. Han, where can people find you on the internet? I am mostly on Twitter at Hazel's Gems, but I'm also on Instagram sometimes at the same user. 
okay, I've definitely interacted with you before, and now I'm putting it all together. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Cool. Good, cool, cool. Good to put a, yeah. a face to the internet name. <laughs> Mike, where can people find you online? Yeah, so you can find my podcast, The News Olympian, wherever pods are cast, just by searching for The News Olympian or going to our website, thenewsolympian.com. The socials for those shows are at News Olympian on Twitter and Instagram. And then if you want to find just me, Mike Schubert, I'm at Schub17, S-C-H-U-B-E-S-1-7 on Twitter and Instagram. And then my website is just Schubes, S-C-H-U-B-E-S-1-7. U-B-dot-e-s. Yay! We will see you all next time. Peace out, everybody. Don't get <laughs> <Bye>. captured. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.